first of all, just a big welcome and thank you for being here this evening. We were joking beforehand that it's just such a sunny and beautiful day, at least here in London. I don't know where everyone else is. Um, that, you know, there would be the temptation to be outside rather than um, inside, listening to hopefully an interesting and engaging conversation about um, how art and health come together. Um, for those of you who don't know me, because um, there's a couple of names I actually don't recognize, um, my name is Jen Ellis, and I am the co-founder, along with Benny, Benny Allen, he's going to wave, <laughs> um, we're the co-founders of, um, of Aura. And Aura, in case you've not visited yet, or even if you have, it's a virtual space and platform that brings together art, architecture, and music with the aim of instilling a sense of calm and well-being. Um, so a little reason why the talk this evening is so important um, is because the idea for Aura actually originated when I was in hospital three and a half years ago. Um, and I noticed that there was art on the walls of the corridors, but there were none in my room. Um, so we thought about how, I mean, why would they bother? What are the neurological benefits of art and how these benefits could be brought over to patients? Now, I mean, all of us, I think, have been quite static for the past few months. And actually, you know, the immobilization is um, beyond people who are in the care of hospitals. But the original idea was that of healing and trying to improve people's health. So with that in mind, um, this is a very special in conversation um, where we have with us uh, a whole bunch of panelists. So we've got Gabriel Hartley, um, who is an artist based in London, um, who I'm gonna put, you know, landscapes, um, creates these beautiful paintings, um, which are incredibly topographical, um, depicting different types of expanses, whether it be greenery or, um, more watery and I discovered his work through a gallery called 17 several months ago and he's one of the exhibited artists he has three works in Aura um, and then we're joined by um, Claire uh, by Helen Phoebe um, and Helen Phoebe is the head of curatorial program over at Yorkshire Sculpture Park and Yorkshire Sculpture Park is actually a place that was very inspirational for both um, Benny and myself because when we were thinking about building in the digital world with soul we thought about those places where art architecture and context comes together and your chest just expands um, and YSP is one of those places and clearly we're not the only ones to think that this was the case because we've got with us Claire Booth um, who's been um, doing a PhD and you just submitted right over at Huddersfield University and it's looking at YSP well-being what, kind, what how, how does it bring you a sense of well-being um, and you're going to be telling us more about that and then last but not least, but actually bringing it back to hospitals, bringing it back to the very core, we've got Katsu Roberts with us, who's the Director of Arts and Health um, for Bart's NHS Health Trust. Um, and it's this organization that's supported by them um, called Vital Arts. So they're commissioning artworks um, for inclusion in these hospitals um, in London. Um, so I thought that rather than listening to more from me, um, it'd be interesting to hear just a little bit more from, you know, Gabriel, Helen, Claire, Katsu about what each one of them are doing. So over to you, Gabriel. Okay. Um, so do you, uh, yeah, I, I'll just talk a little bit about the, um, the last show at 17. Um, so, that, so that was, like you were saying, that was a series of paintings which were um, all on wood, which was kind of carved, um, and then um, painted and kind of stained with kind of very thin layers of watery paint um, until it kind of achieved this kind of optical effect where it came, what it was really about, I suppose, is just about the act of looking and sort of slowing down and finding the form as you look sort of through the, through the image, um, which I think was really interesting putting it into the a digital platform um, as you're doing, um, because it's kind of, Sometimes that gets very lost when you're kind of looking at my paintings online. It's very hard to kind of um, sort of interpret them. Um, and it kind of needs a platform which kind of is quite sensitive like yours to kind of, to kind of um, articulate them, I suppose. Because um, they kind of, you need to see, like you're saying, you have to see all the kind of like surface and how the kind of little, kind of the real details of the paint kind of react. 
um, and no one really wants to take about 10 photos online, they just want one straight thing. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then, and then I suppose that the, the, talking about the, the landscape um, element, um, which yeah, I suppose the, the last two shows at 17, one was, one was actually called Landscapes, um, and this one was called Of, um, which I suppose is a thing, sort of thinking about how I ended up painting these landscape paintings. Because um, I kind of see it as a way in to make a painting um, and what they're kind of about, what they're of, is sort of not really the landscape after a while. It, is, it becomes, like I'm sort of saying, about about almost standing in the landscape and looking. Mm. Um, so actually a place or, or thinking in that way is kind of not what they're really about. Um, I don't know how I got on that point, but yeah. And, and, and how I kind of arrived at that, uh, 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 them being landscapes, I was thinking about in relation to this, because um, I kind of never thought I'd be that, like, it seems like such a, like a middle-aged kind of artist <laughs> to be making landscape paintings. I never thought I'd kind of be that artist, um, but I am becoming middle-aged, maybe it's partly that. Um, but it's, I think it's also, it sort of started off, I, I was doing paintings based on kind of walking um, in the city, um, and the city was kind of a protagonist in the paintings. Mm. Um, and that started in London, and then I carried it on to Rome. Um, and I suppose the things I saw, I was just sort of noting things down, architectural things, but quite often I ended up, it ended up being the elements of nature in the city, which I was kind of um, drawn to these sort of moments of reflection. Um, and then that kind of just somehow sort of transpired to that. And I suppose the city is always there in these paintings, I feel. I feel it's kind of just sort of lurking in the background, either in the kind of colour or there's quite often like window shapes or, um, or, or forms like that. Well, I mean, there's a painting called City Wave in the, in the last show, um, which was alongside, which was kind of this, this painting of clouds kind of forming in the city. Mm. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'm waffling a little bit, but, but hopefully that kind of gives a, a bit of an um, insight into what, what I, I no, and I, I think that's incredible. And I love the sense of how th these pockets of like greenery or nature in a city. Um, I lived in Hong Kong for five years and I would mm. always go and try to find them, these pockets of calm. And I will send something to you afterwards, but there's something, is an app called Tranquil City and they're actually recording them across the city um, in different ones from London to Hong Kong. And I, and I really relate to that, what you're saying. And I think from my thought process, when I was including your work, I was like, well, for this first exhibition, what are the different things that can bring a sense of calm and, 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 and pleasure and relaxation? And this was in conversation with, you know, doctor, doctors specializing, specializing in autism over to, you know, eyesight. And one of them is those different expanses. And even if you are in the city, you can have that moment where you carve it out for yourself and you just see something that's a little bit different, which is obviously very different from being over at Yorkshire, right, <laughs> Helen, <laughs> where you've got these undulating hills. And um, well, I mean, you tell us more um, ab about, about that and also the way that you've been, because you've been building up Yorkshire Sculpture Parks program for, for years, right? Do you really been growing it? If you let me share screen, I'll share a couple of images. But yeah, I've worked at a sculpture park for nearly 20 years and I first visited as a kid on school visits. So I've, it's a very familiar landscape to me. Um, I'm head of curatorial program, which means we curate a rolling program of exhibitions in six gallery spaces, including an 18th century chapel, as well as in 500 acres of landscape and that is a historically designed landscape so we know that it's been occupied since the Norman conquest and it's had various different owners we now manage 500 acres of that and in itself that is um it's it's a very beautiful space but it also is a quite dominant space whenever we're curating we're thinking about everything in relation to the landscape itself and the foundation blocks of the loan collection are Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth who were both born in Wakefield, so really nearby. And one of the lovely things that Henry Moore said is that an artist should open people's eyes to seeing nature. That's what he felt his job was. And I think people do, when they're spending time at Sculpture Park, their eyes are bigger somehow, and then they're looking at a tree in a way that's quite sculptural. And then I've established three different strands of programme which really encapsulate all of the different activity we do. And that is the Innovative Museum, which is rooted in our 
um, history. We grew out of Bretton Hall College, which was an arts teacher training college established in 1949 with the view um, by Alec Clegg with the view that art could help to rebuild the, war, the world after the war and that if you nurture everybody's creativity they will be fully rounded human beings no matter what profession they might go into because you need creative problem solving innovative thinkers in every discipline so one of the things we've been doing is working with people at the university of huddersfield and leeds and bringing them into conversation with artists to really think about the problems in the world so that's one strand another strand is the history present and future of sculpture which is fairly straightforward so we do art historical shows like david smith the present and future so working with established artists but also the future um, so this week i've had the great pleasure of selecting the graduate awards from various different universities and so we invest in that point where students are becoming artists and that transition period which can be, can be a really vulnerable time um, and we also work very closely with our learning team um, one of my former colleagues rachel massey is an artist and she also was a well-being coordinator at ysp for a number of years and for example we did a project which was a co-commission with 1418 now to commemorate the role of women in the first world war particularly horseback nurses and so we have a horse jump which is activated by a horse and rider um, and the parallel program that Rachel Massey did was a program of equine assisted therapy with women in vulnerable circumstances such as um, subject to domestic violence or who'd been trafficked so that I think is a really amazing project that brings together the whole soul of YSP and what it's about amazing um, and then obviously Claire we, you, you mentioned um, Huddersfield right but Claire you've you've um that's where you've been finishing up your phd and you've been spending a lot of time at ysb but you've been going okay ysb we love your program but actually you know what are what are you doing for people for their souls for their mindsets for their well-being right yeah totally um like helen i grew up like near ysb so i've been going since i was a kid i think there's something about the place that makes you go back <laughs> yeah. i think that you know it's it means a lot to a lot of different people and that was what was so interesting about doing the research. Um, yeah, so the title of my thesis is Does YSP Make You Happy? Creating <laughs> Situated Narratives of Wellbeing at the Orchard Sculpture Park. So I began the research with questions like Does YSP Make You Happy? And the answer was yes, for some people, sometimes. <laughs> um, but I guess it became a lot more complicated than that, as you would imagine. Um, because happiness is only one emotion on like a spectrum of like emotional experiences that people really valued there. Mm. Um, so I think happiness was quite limited. So that's kind of where the turn to well-being came from. It was like thinking about it in a more well-rounded fashion. Um, but yeah, so what I became interested in was how YSP became a place of well-being for people and loads of people that I would speak to would kind of immediately be like, oh yes, yeah, it's great. It's, I go there, I go there to walk like once or twice a week. I go once a month, I go uh, three, I make sure I go three times a year, like I have to go there. It's kind of like a, a need, need to do it. Um, so yeah, I was kind of thinking about how it became this place and the different contingencies, contexts, Relationships, relationships and narratives that facilitate well-being in that place and what was it about the interaction between the people, the landscape, the sculpture that had this kind of transformative impact on their, on their lives really. It was like a really important place for people throughout their biographies. Um, yeah, I'm sure I'll go into like more <laughs> detail yeah. later as and when it comes up but yeah, absolutely. But I find it so interesting what you were saying that you started off with this point of happiness, right? And you're like, actually, let's expand it. Um, and well-being. I love the idea that you you just encounter the artworks, but really what you're going there to do is walk. Uh, yeah. And I know there's, there's going to be much more nuances because we had a little pre-chat beforehand. Yeah. Um, but just this idea of incorporating it into, you know, your, um, your everyday life, um, yeah. which I think you know, brings us over in a very different context, in a different, very different manner, you know, over to Katsu and the work that, you, incredible work that you've been doing, right? Um, where yeah. part of our everyday life is really taking care of ourselves or being there for others, or hopefully maybe not ending up in hospital, but also that can also be joyful, right? If you're bringing someone to the world and it's so varied and so complex um, and all the incredible work you've been doing um, in, you know, the, the arts and health sphere. Um, but, you know, no more for me, over to you. 
<laughs> so um, we are embedded within the NHS Trust. So we're the, I now call us the Arts and Health Service or the Arts and Wellbeing Service. And we're employed by lar the largest trust in the UK. And the um, idea is to very basically to enhance the clinical environment and in turn improve the patient experience. Um, but for me, it's much wider than that. It's larger than that. Um, but we do that uh, with a couple of ways. We commission site-specific artwork. So this will be site-specific and I call it patient responsive and also uh, context sensitive. So all the artwork is born of this long and deep engagement by the artist who spends time. They might do a workshop. Um, they get to know one artist, Jack Nimke, was there at four o'clock in the morning in the a &E, kids A&E just to get the sense of what really happens. So Peter Liversidge was an artist in residence. Richard Wentworth just ransacked all of the uh, um, archives. So artists get really deeply uh, embedded. Catherine Yass was really interested in the historic Jordan building. So um, then they make an artwork that responds to the context to the patient demographics, the people who are using those services. Mm. Um, and along with that, we have a sort of an artist in residency program, as I mentioned, but the other really big thing we do, which really wasn't my, I'm a curator for 30 years, you know? Uh, uh, so we had this whole other strand that's really important. It's the participation program. So it's music and dance and workshops, and it's actual kind of a, an engagement um, with, patients and, and staff as well. So we work with the London Symphony Orchestra. I always talk about how they come and play to the babies in the incubators and they help um, in uptake in oxygen, for example, or we work with Trinity Laban or Academy Dance who brings in South Asian dancers and they focus on a range of things from just having a, um, agility in the hands, you know, which can be a problem yeah. with older people, but you know, a lot of older men who've never cooked and then they're widowed and then they don't, they have problems just using their hands. So all those movements you have a South Asian dance can work on those. Or um, the key thing, of course, is uh, developing a sense of balance and spatial awareness, because that's huge in elderly patients and preventing falls, because you don't want a patient to have been in the hospital with pneumonia, for example, get ready to go, get up, you know, go to the loo and break a hip because they fell. So all there the thing, are, yeah. yeah, it's all, all the, so there are, there are those lots of studies about how it has a specific application, but I'm coming from a curatorial background. What I'm really interested in, as well as all of that, is sort of a larger social agenda of bringing really great, you know, museum quality work to people who might not otherwise access art. So yeah. for me, it's about opening minds, changing hearts, just bringing contemporary culture to people who might not otherwise access it. Yeah, and, 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 and bring it to them and all those incredible, um, incredible examples that you've given, you know, over from like, uh, Richard Wentworth to, to, to Liversidge and... And Reese Korn. And Reese, like, ah, I love yeah. it. I, yeah, it's... Uh, it's it's so incredible, and I think it comes back to, um, you know, one of the one of the core tenets of what we are thinking about. You know, it's different, but you know, one thing that Benny and I have been talking about from the outset is access, right? And one thing that we've talked about is, and actually, it was also open, speaking to you, you opened my eyes as well because we were saying, okay, well, anyone anywhere in the world um, at any point in time with an internet connection can have access. But then you're like, yeah, but then there's a lot of people in, in, in hospital who don't necessarily have internet access. And I was like, oh man. So it's a whole other thing, you know, and also this morning, not to go on a complete, um, not on a, go on a complete tangent, but I was also speaking with someone in prisons, from prisons this morning. And they were also saying the question about, um, about, um, about internet access. But I think that, thank you so much for introducing all of yourselves. I feel like now, um, we had a little bit of a pre-chat this morning and it was very lively. Um, so I think that, you know, we opened the floor and I should say that, uh, you know, to everyone here, the points of these coming together, the intimate digital gatherings, um, you know, so don't, don't hesitate in putting a question through into the, into the chat or, you know, raising, um, you know, putting yourself off mute um, later on. Like we really want to hear from you. Um, so one of my initial thoughts, and this was something that we were chatting about, um, um, chatting about previously was 
Gabriel, you were saying something about, you know, with landscapes and how you kind of came back to it. It was this idea of looking, right? You really want people to, to look and to see and to spend time. And that's something that we've been thinking about as well a lot. There's difference between um, just looking and seeing. And maybe you could expand a little bit about that um, in, your, in, your, in your practice or something, or something yeah, um, to do in general. Well, yeah, I think, I mean, that's, I think there's so much to be um, sort of thought about in terms of looking and making <laughs> um, and the kind of different, the kind of different types of looking involved um, as you're making. Sometimes you kind of, you kind of after these moments where you're kind of almost not, very cut, you're kind of not thinking and you're kind of, you're really, I, I, and, and then, and you're just completely in the zone. And those are the moments I'm really after, uh, kind of, I sort of forget everything I know and I'm kind of in dealing with what's, the other thing which is kind of left um and then the moment after is about looking at what what you what i've done after that and that can sometimes be a, a horrible thing They're like what the hell is that i just made mm -hmm. or it can be it can be kind of um something hopefully something kind of can't happen um but then i think yeah i think that, that's a, that's sort of one part of looking um which is do with the making side of it um but then there's i, I had i just just back at the at the tape looking at the um Seagram murals, the, the Rothko room. And that was kind of, it was just so great being back there. Um, Cause it kind of was just, I had kind of really realized I haven't kind of like slowed down and really looked at something for a long time in, in, in months now. Mm. Um, and so, so yeah, I kind of feel that that's a, a thing that art can do. Um, it can kind of, it can slow you down to a point um, where you look in a way that perhaps you don't necessarily normally look in the world or, 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 and then I think it was really interesting what you said about um, what Helen was saying about how it can help you then look at the world afterwards, because that's kind of the, the goal, I suppose, is then, I mean, trees are, are such a, I mean, a, a tree is better than most sculptures, isn't it? Really? It, when you look at it, it, kind of, it, it, it does, it does so much. <laughs> Giuseppe Pannoni wouldn't agree. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, he might do it. He, he, it might be the hardest thing for him to, to admit. <laughs> um, but yeah, I suppose, yeah, I, and I suppose also that, that it's the, the actual looking of, of looking at things quickly is also something to be, um, not to be completely like poo pooed. It's kind of, it's very important to be able to kind of um, look at things on our phone and, and appreciate kind of what, what that kind of looking is about, that kind of just deciphering something very quickly and then moving on and thinking, oh, that's cool. Oh, no. You know what I mean? That's something, there is something very important. Yeah, that immediacy. Well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that is very important as well. I'm wondering, are you thinking at all, I mean, it's such an old uh, essay now, but I'm thinking of Michael Fried and that whole idea of the theatricality and how you look at a work of art, because the mm -hmm. way you described your work sounds very sculptural in a way. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you kind of go in and look at it, but then there's the the distance and the recoup, or the, the stepping back in a way. Yeah, yeah. The, I think so the, those the three the, you know the three hundred and sixty degree way that you would approach your work is not usual for most paintings. I mean, conventionally. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I come from a place where I make sculptures and paintings, so it kind of it, it, it sort of very easily kind of bled into the. To, I sort of got that process, I suppose, from making sculptures. Um, I was using the kind of same tool to, to carve out um, resin sculpture I was making. So that's kind of how I, I, yeah, I see painting in a similar way where I kind of want to get really involved and walk around it and what happens when you're that close to it. So I realize how blue my hands are when I do that. <laughs> uh, when, 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 yeah, what happens when you're kind of like right up against the painting and, and when you're really far away from it, it's such, it's such a different experience um, for me. And I suppose the screen does another whole thing of looking at that. It, it kind of, um, it, it, it positions the work in, a, in, you have to deal with it as an image. That's something we have to deal with is, is when you make something is what, it, what happens when it becomes an image. So it's also, um, it's also about opticality in a way. I'm thinking, of yeah, yeah. you know, when you and have to high, you look, you, there, it has different experiences when you're on it, when you're back, you know. Definitely. And, and I, I think, and, and I suppose with mine, actually, there's a thing which you, you almost have to like blur your eyes to really see the, to, to sort of get the image. It's sort of like, you, do you remember those posters in the 90s where you had to kind of, um, I can't remember what they're called actually, where you kind of, you kind of like blurred your eyes and there's kind of like a train or something would like pop out of it. There's something that kind of happens with, with, with my work where you kind of have to kind of like sort of almost sort of zone out to sort of see it. So yeah, I, all those things I'm kind of really sort of interested in in terms of how, how we look and how we kind of, just the different ways we kind of look.
And one of the things I'm really interested in is how we curate for different people. I mean, we always curate thinking of how people are going to experience it, but everybody comes to an artwork with their own lived experience and everybody experiences that artwork based on that. And sometimes it can trigger stuff that we don't expect, both mm. good and bad. Um, and there's, there's, you kind of, you can't control that. But I find that fascinating that every artwork is different to everybody that encounters it. Yeah, absolutely. And doesn't that link into Claire, weren't you saying something about one of your findings of memory and you know how people, um, I, I'll let you say more, but I, I, th I thought that was very, very thoughtful. Yeah, well, what, one of the things that I guess came out of the research is that people have a really strong, they build really strong relationships with artwork. So it's not just a kind of one off thing. And it was really interesting when you're talking, sorry, I'm going to go on a tangent first and I'll come back to that. <laughs> um, when you're talking about this, the looking, um, the kind of building of a relationship through looking, I, I found really fascinating when talking to people because, you know, a lot of the people who took part in the research are really passionate about YFG, but don't have a traditional art history education. Like, they don't know much about the works, but they have this relationship with them purely through the visual because they like how it looks and they've seen it change. Um, they've seen it change in the seasons and we spent, um, so part of the research that I did, we were kind of, I was like walking around with groups of people and there are people who visit regularly, but wouldn't normally do it in this way. Um, so I think because we were all doing it together, we ended up spending a lot more time in certain places than we would have done on our own perhaps, or spending time in different kinds of places because that was somebody else's favorite sculpture. So <laughs> at the Henry Moore, two large forms. And I think we were looking at it for like 20 minutes. And that's for me is a very long time to be looking at Henry Moore sculpture, <laughs> which is, you know, like my own kind of, not biases, but preferences. And, but it was amazing, like what I saw in that afterwards, the kind of textures and the colors and stuff like that that were coming out that I hadn't really noticed before. And other people were having the same thing. So I think there is this kind of like, active looking through which you build these relationships and yeah like at YSP like people have a really really strong relationship to the landscape and the different kind of memories that are like inscribed within it um, mm -hmm. and they kind of come come through as you walk around um, yeah Is there anything come out about people experiencing the artwork differently on their own or with other people whether it was a better or worse thing to do um, I think it was a mix, you know, it's people, you know, people tend to come on their own or come with people and either way it's a different experience. And I think that for the people who come on their own, it's not like they're just visiting on their own, they kind of, you know, you take the experiences away and give them to other people at other times, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So you might come on your own and have these kind of individual experiences, but then you might come again with other people and share those experiences or go home and talk about it with other people. Um, and there were people who would come on their own religiously like every every week and that would be like their thing that they did um as a kind of cleanser of the week because they'd come and walk around but then they'd come at another time with with for a different purpose so it kind of served different purposes for the different people and again i don't know whether i was going around in a group was like biasing <laughs> in in a way because it wasn't natural you know it wasn't the kind of way that these people would normally have experienced it it was like vital to have that conversation as we were going around in order to get the data so um <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of impossible to yeah what i really wanted to have was like to have the immediacy rather than people coming back and recounting their stories so um it was kind of important that we did it like that but i do yeah i guess it wasn't they were in a social context that perhaps they wouldn't have normally been because if they were coming on their own with other people sorry it'd be with people that they knew not a bunch of strangers yeah <laughs> which is like a different thing as well i yeah. think you it, i think it's really interesting what you're saying about memory but also just to bring it back slightly to the particular term that of opticality that was brought up mm -hmm. um because i mean when we were in the development of aura we consulted um, a doctor over at moorfields hospital that specializes in eyesight um, and so two big things that he told us, number one was don't make this just for VR because it's one of the fastest ways by which you can actually transmit diseases. And it's something we hadn't even thought about. Like we were just kind of like, yeah, VR headsets. Yeah, yeah swell. Um, the the other, world. Infection yeah, world. <laughs> Security, infection control. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I was like so naive. Um, and the other thing was when we were thinking about navigating through the space, um, 
it was, oh, people get dizzy, which I can completely imagine. So he's like, you've got to find as smooth a way as going around it um, as possible. So I was just thinking about opticality, but also opticality is a very, in my, I, in my, in my mind, um, a very doctor's term. You're thinking about optics and so on and so forth. And there was something that struck me that was very interesting this morning. Katsu, when we were talking about like the artwork that you've commissioned, I mean, you go, it's not to say that it's, you get asked sometimes for, you know, landscape with a little tree with, you know, with a, with, 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 I don't know, like water or something. And you're like, no, no, we're going to go bold. Um, so um, I think it'd be really interesting to hear, you know, what you have to say about that. And it's not being anti-landscape when it comes yeah. to the health space, but it's being like, okay, I see you. I see what you want to achieve. Let me see how I can also maybe try to get there this way. Yeah. So um, yeah, of course I'm not against, I'm, I mean, I studied art history. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I love Claude. I mean, of course I'm interested in landscape, but it, it also um, is sort of the go-to mode for, for art in hospitals, I'm afraid, because people have a very um, limited experience of what art is. Um, and so what I was saying before is people say, can, you, can it be green? Can it be blue? You know, can it have, you know, like, and I'm always trying to avoid NHS green and <laughs> NHS blue. Um, and I, I feel like I'm often trying to fend off a barrage of, you know, quaint, quaint landscape paintings as the go-to mode. Um, because they're not a panacea for well-being, you know. Um, I mentioned before that a lot of our patients, for, for a lot of our patients, grazing cows would be totally anathema, it'd be totally alienating. You know, like I said earlier when we were speaking, we have young teenage, uh, and, and not, you know, young patients, teenagers who have never, ever seen the sea. They've never been to a field. They haven't seen landscape. And it can be really alienating like that. Um, but more than anything, relying, if you will, on landscape just cuts out a huge amount of other kind of production. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to confirm what people think they like. Um, so we do actually, we're commissioning right now an artist who's, you'd have to say landscape, you know, um, her, her work is very much about landscape and it is landscape. Um, but there's just so much other areas to look at in terms of, of art. So I don't want to just give them what they think they want. Um, there's so much other work that isn't about that, what I said before, kind of that placating or making people calm just for the sake of it. I don't, I don't want to just anesthetize people. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah. So, so going back to your idea, yeah, I'm, I, I try to push well past that and give things that people don't know they might want and introduce, I mean, I'm a curator, you know, I want to introduce great contemporary art. We've done stuff with Hervin Anderson, Amalia Pika, you know, I mean, you, you, well, you look at our website, but um, mm -hmm. one quote we just got the other day, which I'm really excited about is by someone who works at the Royal London Hospital, um, who said to a colleague, or they were doing a little session, and she said, I didn't know I liked art until I started working at this hospital. And to me, that's worth uh, all of, you know. Yeah. It was just huge. <laughs> you know, that's like, got it. Yeah. <laughs> one, one down to 200, you know, <laughs> more to go today. But, you know, I, I bet um, in a way, Helen, that's sort of what it, you know, for you too, as a curator, trying to uh, offer a bridge, offer a, uh, yeah. a pathway into... It's not just art, it's art is philosophy. Art is philosophy made flesh. So it's about getting people to think. It's about people engaging in ideas. And if they do it through art, that's great. But you know, art is just the visual outcome of philosophy, ideas, politics in some ways. Yeah, I definitely see the sculpture park as a place where extraordinary things can happen, even if that's very small or it can be quite major. And I'm really interested in why people are choosing to walk in our park than any other park. And they're definitely making that decision because because there's art there even if that's perhaps not even a conscious decision and we know of a lot of people who will walk their dogs and then sort of get to know a few Henry Moores and then when we have the Henry Moore exhibition in the galleries we'll then take the step to go into the galleries but then we'll make the journey to go to the Hepworth in Wakefield or the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds you know it's starting that journey and I think there are so we st there are still barriers to people coming to the sculpture park but I think there are a lot less than some which somewhere which has big imposing architecture and we're quite surprised, you know, we don't expect that everybody will like everything. 
And then there's been some real surprises in our programming about things that have proven to be really popular that we didn't anticipate to be. Or, I mean, the most controversial exhibition I put on was an Andy Goldsworthy exhibition, Can You Believe? Because there was a there was a sequence of works when he was a student of him killing a rabbit, skinning it, cooking it and eating it. Um, and that was that had more complaints about that than anything else we've ever shown because people were saying <laughs> you have an 18 certificate. Um, but we were like then started a conversation around, but do you know where you buy me do your children <laughs> eat and they know where it comes from? And that, you know, for me, working on a landscape which is also a working farm with three tenant farmers, that's part of our understanding of what happens out in a field. But for a lot of people who maybe live in a city, not to generalise too much, but then come for a nice day out in nature, shocked that there's death <laughs> and death that they eat. It's like even if there's rabbit stew on the menu at the absolutely. cafe, you know, disassociation, complete disassociation, which I found really fascinating as well. We did a project at, um, when I was a senior curator at Arnold Feeney called uh, the Silk Purse Procedure, which I co-curated with Claire Doherty, actually. Oh. Yeah. And I brought in an artist, uh, a Danish, uh, I mean, um, a Dutch artist. And one of the, I have just quickly mentioned, because it, it was during foot and mouth. Um, and we had two huge tanks of live bass. And I hired some sushi son. And during the opening, they picked the bass, they killed it. And we ate sushi. And people, you know, that, that same idea that it was shortening the distance between yeah. the food and the but there was a lot of people who were kind of shocked. There was blood and, you know, and that, well, that was, I think it was 1999. Or, yeah. So there was, anyway. But it yeah. makes it some more, it's more authentic, isn't it? And the thing I learned from Andy and his practice is he's reconciling his own mortality within the natural world. That's how he's reconciling his, his lifespan. And I wonder how that translates in a hospital environment. If you have to avoid things like that, if it's just too sensitive, you know, is there a, not that there'd be censorship, but there's obviously a sensitivity. Yeah, there's certain, of course, there's also cultural sensitivities, all kinds yeah. of sensitivities. Um, um, I, th I think of it this way. There is a lot of work that's really important and interesting, but it just wouldn't work. Like Herman Nitsch, we're not going to show Herman Nitsch, you know, <laughs> it's obvious. Um, but there is so much great work out there that, uh, has the ability to reach out to people and that is great great practice so i mean i always think there's like this you know there's just infinite amount of art there's this much which i think is interesting or that i would say is good after that there's that what personally i'm interested in, but it's not about me it's what i think would work within the context and then there's a slim line so one hospital would probably have different artists than another hospital and one department would have a completely different art than an uh, artist than another department. So it's yeah. all kind of has to fit together. But within that, there's just thousands and thousands of possible yeah. artists that we can use. And we even limit it to people who are based in the UK because we don't yeah. have the budgets and because they'll have an appreciation understanding. But um, I mean, there's certain things that, you know, obviously we just don't, no, it's just a lot smarter, you know. It's completely the same for us, for, for example, we have a, 18th century chapel and the graveyard is still quite an active graveyard so we have to be very sensitive about what we show in that graveyard space and in the chapel itself um you know some artists have made proposals which were completely you know artists we would really want to work with but that were just not right for that context or for that mm -hmm. setting and there's we don't shy away from putting challenging work on so it's not that everything we put on we expect to make people happy and like claire was saying that that is a it's unnatural to be happy all the time that isn't a, that isn't a full lived experience so some of the yeah. work we put on can be quite challenging or, or questioning or drawing attention to really terrible things that are happening in the world yeah. um, and we do see that as actually part of people's well-being so I think that's where the difference Claire I think we've talked about that before the difference between somebody's well-being and somebody's happiness the well-being is a much more complex set of emotions. their comfort zone yeah yeah. I mean, I heard recently at Mansion House that some conference, you know, this, I think it's a kind of a trite phrase, but I like it. It's uh, art should uh, comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. I mean, I That's can't remember right. who, who said it, but, in, you know, in a way, I certainly take the first part. And in a way, I want to, you know, epiter uh, le bourgeoisie in a, in a sense, too. Yeah. You know, we're all interested in moving people from, uh, 
their uh, preconceived notions or, you know, I wouldn't, in my case, it wouldn't be get them off the comfort seat, but it is about asking them to ask questions about their assumptions in some yeah. ways. Yeah. It's, just a, it's a little click of the fingers just to snap people out of something, isn't it? And I think what's great about Aora and what you, Benny, have done, Jen, is you've thought about the architecture as well. You've thought about the complete environment, the space. It's not mm -hmm. just, and it all complements each other. And you can tell that there's some references to existing architecture. Some of it's, you know, entirely imaginary. And how did that? Yeah, I mean, this is definitely something for Benny to pick up. But the one thing that I will say is, I remember going to having discussions with multiple museum directors around the world and having the discussion about, oh, will someone with a wheelchair can't get up that ramp? Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, with Benny, one of the early on discussions, I mean, like, Benny is an incredible architect. I'm like, you got to go create. Um, <laughs> but um, but um, you've got to make it wheelchair free. Like, it's just something instinctive. I know that when I've not been able to move, it frustrates me if I need to think about climbing up some stairs. Um, but yeah, maybe Benny, I mean, all our, all your inspo, all the inspo for the spaces, because they're so particular. Um, where to start? Uh, so it was a really interesting question that uh, Jen and I posed ourselves when we first started to think about the gallery, because with virtual reality, you have, you know, uh, limitless possibilities. So you could design whatever you want. And the important thing for us was to actually think about spaces that we were inspired by and we thought worked really well for the display of art. And um, one of the things for me as an architect, uh, I think that you should always create spaces that people can associate with, even if they're quite unusual. Some of the shapes might be um, not what you'd expect from most buildings, but just so that when people come and experience the gallery, they know that they're in some sort of building um, because I think you want to try and create that connection. And what we thought was really special about creating this new world was that we would be able to break down barriers of what a gallery is and allow people that might not necessarily feel like they can actually step into a gallery. And, you know, I've, I have this conversation with many, many people to actually give them that opportunity so that they can experience it and maybe feel that they've got the confidence to, um, you know, have, have that space to themselves. Um, and then just briefly about some of the architecture itself, one of the main rooms, which is the circular one, was inspired by a palace that was built for the Emperor Nero in 64 AD. And um, it was actually only there for about four years because the next emperor who uh, took over basically built over the palace. And this was then discovered uh, when Michelangelo, Michelangelo was able to go down and see these frescoes, which inspired his own work. So I thought it'd be a really lovely opportunity to allow people to visit this space, which no one else has really experienced. So that's kind of some of the ideas. Yeah, but I, I love this idea of imagination and letting it wander. And it kind of brings back to something where I discovered this morning that apparently YSP was not discover, described as NHS for the soul. It was actually, what did you discover, Claire? It was, NA, it was NHS for the imagination, which... Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of uh, an errant quote. <laughs> we had to chase it down a bit. But it was interesting, you know, it's interesting that that kind of was circulating for, for a while, wasn't it, Helen? It was kind yeah. of within the kind of organisation's myth yeah, we, we totally latched onto this. We yeah. inverted it in our heads and latched onto it and kept repeating it, even put it in a PhD <laughs> advert. But um, I think the fact that it was, that it's still the NHS of the imagination, the fact that it's still seen as something that's a core yeah. part of a medical need, or that it's providing a key service that's absolutely fundamental to people's lives. I find that really interesting and that it was said in the 80s that, you know, before it's a very long-standing perception of YSP as not being an art gallery or not just an art gallery, mm -hmm. that it's doing the combination of the heritage of the site, the landscape and the art is, is coming together in a way which is much bigger than its parts, I suppose, which I think has kind of come out in your research, has been borne out in your research. Because I know, Claire, you did really want to challenge all of that and kind of 
say, you know, yeah, YSP isn't necessarily making everybody happy, but everybody you ask seems to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's, you know, it's the job of the outsider, isn't it, to come in yeah. and oh, um, And I think that you wouldn't have wanted it any other way. Absolutely. But yeah, you know, I, it was challenging to find people with opposing views. It really was. Um, but uh, again, I'm sure I could have gone to different places and asked, but I was really trying to focus on the people that were coming. But even, you know, the people that were coming, there were, there were differences in opinion. And initially, when I was just kind of doing on the spot interviews of people in and around the galleries and in and around the park, people were quite, re some people were quite resistant to the kind of medicalization of, of art. So they were resistant to the idea of it being the NHS. I think they agreed in sentiment that it was, you know, they came for a reason and that reason was because it made them feel better <laughs> in some, in some way, but they were resistant to it being medicalized. And I think that's more trying to protect the YSP as an organization as opposed to, um, kind of the other way around I guess it's more like we don't we don't want YSP to have to prescribe to these criteria as opposed to yeah not you know not seeing they're not thinking that it doesn't work in that way um and I kind of I, I do kind of agree with that I think that it'd be dangerous if if cultural organizations had to kind of um work the same standard as health organizations like they're two different things two different kinds of Really, it's really it's written, I'm I'm cautious, and I think you did a, you did a, there's a whole chapter of yours on this. I think about the whole well-being and culture, yeah, agenda and where it's come from, and um, is it a cost-saving measure by the government? If you if the GP is writing a prescription to go to an art gallery, it, it, is that a shortcut which isn't actually help? You know, there's there's a oh, lot. I didn't even think, think of that. that. It's called social prescript social yeah. prescribing. Social prescribing, yeah. okay. Um, but then there's also, you know, like we were talking about when Rachel was running the wellbeing program, she was always really careful to bring in a group analyst into a situation where there could be people who had trauma and, and that, you know, curators aren't trained to to deal with that or know how to. So that there's, I think you were really strong on pulling out, problematizing this whole potential agenda and yeah. pointing out. curators just had to steer well clear and just let the professionals kind of handle certain situations. I think there's social prescribing initiatives that are excellent and and do work really well for the people that they're supposed to work for but they're not for everyone you know I think that's whereas going to an art gallery hypothetically is for everyone obviously there are people there'll be people that don't feel like they're they're included and don't have access and that's the kind of problem that's being you know hopefully addressed by most most organizations yeah. but um but yeah the kind of i don't i don't think it is for every single art gallery to have a arts and prescription program because you need to they need to be properly funded and properly resourced and properly staffed and you know to some places that's just not possible at that moment in time without a kind of huge amount of extra money you know, well, funding. wouldn't that just be an extension of their outreach or their education program yeah i mean a lot of the times it is but a lot but then what you yeah what you might end up having this is a kind of hypothetical situation is is kind of educate you know learning staff delivering well-being programming and they're they're kind of slightly different you know without having extra training or extra resources to do that um but it also extends to things like joining a choir yeah 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 definitely it's yeah. kind of art therapy in in a, yeah it's not just passive looking you know going yeah. back to looking at getting actively engaging with creativity, which now people think, and I agree, uh, can help boost your resilience and help mm. knit people back into a community because a lot of people presenting at the GP are lonely and isolated or you know feel out of sorts. And you join a choir, sometimes it unlocks. And were you that's saying that you were you saying that you have participatory programs as well in the hospital? It's not just a case of art being around people; they can actually, yeah, take yeah. Part. yeah, a big part of our, like I said, visual art is what people see. But we have a participation program. Like I was saying, you know, the LSO comes in; they play to wonderful. Yeah, there's a whole range of participatory arts. We at one point when we had more staff, when I had more staff. 
uh, we had, you know, film programs, animation programs, um, puppet, puppet <laughs> workshops. Um, we would go into the renal department where people are just strapped in on dialysis for hours at a time. And there'd be a range of projects that we, we would deliver. I mean, we even had um, the uh, now famous jelly mongers called Bombison Parr come in oh, yes. and do jelly, you know, <laughs> extravaganza with the kids. So, you know, it's, it can be a lot of children or older people, or just a range of things, but it's about um, engagement, engagement. Yeah. And I'm, so we, I, I, we go where they are, you know, we go find them. And so uh, depending on what area, what demographic, what people we go and make, develop a program specifically for that patient group. Do you know if that builds a habit that then continues when people have left? Hopefully, yeah. 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 And that's the idea. I mean, they won't be able to, um, you know, do the workshops because we ha they don't have the materials, but it's, it's to develop the habit of engagement, creativity, finding themselves. You know, for me, it's just about getting, putting people, enabling in individuals to locate that, the poetic within them, you know, yeah. and hopefully, and recognizing the latent poetry in everyday life. So a lot of artwork, say by um, Leo Fitzmorris, he just uses old cereal boxes or something like that. And then you look at the art and then you have a lot of people going, oh, well, is that art? But it's a bunch of cereal boxes, but oh, I can do that too. Let's go through the recycling, you know, and make some art. So it's, it's that giving them that tool. In a really nice kind of loop, we have a work by Louis, um, Leo Fitzmaurice, which is called Arcadia. So I actually first drive yeah. in Sculpture Park, but it's like a motorway sign. Yeah. yeah um, and so he's, he's kind of bringing all of that questioning around it being a pleasure ground yeah. uh, as it was originally designed. And of course, the famous, if you're a landscape, so it's in Ed, Arcadio Ego, you know, yeah. the famous, yeah. you know, okay. landscape painting. Which actually, I, I've been thinking this whole time, right? Um, because we got to hear at the start about, you know, Gabriel and how, you, what, what you're creating and your inspiration and this idea of seeing and looking. And I'm listening to all of this and I had various thoughts. I mean, have you ever thought about your work in the context of health or well-being? And another thing I was thinking about is like, there's all these different places of display, right? We are literally talking about three incredibly different mm. places. And, you know, is, is there anything from you as an artist perspective that- um, Yeah, I've never, I've never, really, I never really think about it in, in those terms, I'm really honest, in terms of, yeah. um, <laughs> but I, you know, I think there's enough to worry about just making the thing before, you know, I think I've, um, in terms of, it's really difficult thinking about like a viewer, because like, like you're saying, there's so many different people who have so many different interpretations to it I think all I can really think about is just sort of like what I think about is just thinking about reflection mm. in sort of very different ways sort of promoting a sort of self-reflection um or like holding up mirrors just sort of reflecting what's around me um and then more than that I think kind of that's up to that's up to the creator <laughs> that's up to you guys and yeah. not, you know I, I, you know what I mean I've done my bit <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love that. On that note, I was wondering whether anybody has any questions or wants to chime in. Um, we would love to hear from you. Um, but in the meantime, I will just say I love this idea of a mirror um, and holding it up. Um, and I mean, that definitely has an impact on, on me. Um, so. But isn't that what art is supposed to do? Yes. Hold up yeah. Exactly. Contemporary. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got a quick question just in terms of because you know what we've produced is in the digital I just wondered uh, from the perspective of uh, maybe through the NHS or Yorkshire Sculpture Park how you see the digital having an influence um, you know with art people engaging with it that sort of thing. I think what's really exciting about what you've done is you created something for a digital space what I saw a lot of and what we tried to avoid doing at the beginning of lockdown was try and shift what we did on site online mm -hmm. because they're two very, very different sets of circumstances that are accessed differently. Um, and I think that's why what you're doing is really exciting because it is really pushing that, pushing the possibilities 
and I think it can it does have the potential to bring in a lot of people who wouldn't normally come to a museum or gallery but who may be gamers or online or very digitally native um, so there's a lot of crossover there and I think as well it, it could work the other way in that one of the things we found is some of our friends of YSP who may be older generation or retired like my mum's a great example but they um, resent stuff being online they don't want to go online they find it threatening whereas what you've created is a space where I think because it's it's very easy to use it's very intuitive I think that could break down that barrier as well so you're breaking down a barrier for people who are very tech native into the art but also the other way <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's a work in progress it's a continual work in progress we joke this is aura point one you know like we're always taking in ux um yeah suggestions um because yeah it is something it is something new um but one thing that i will say i'll just just share something this came to mind because we're talking about the space i don't know if people have been in it but one thing that's been really beautiful is playing with the light yeah and, you know the yeah, way yeah, about that. yeah. Yeah, and so you know, there were moments where we were with the with the VR tech, and I was like, "No, can you make the light dimmer or not so bright? Because now it looks like light boxes." And can we move this work a little bit to the right so that it just slightly skims it? And I'm like, I feel like I'm painting, <laughs> like nice. I'm, I'm I'm painting yeah. nature and with nature and light. And you does know. does the light ever change in in the space? It can does you get it not. To... Does it mean it will ever? <laughs> yeah, because I always find that really interesting how how things change as you, as as the light changes. It re you can kind of have a really different experience of, but that'd be very difficult to do through photo photography. You'd probably have to photograph it like every moment of the day or <laughs> something. I don't know. Well, actually, just on that, can I just add to that? There, there, that is something that Jen and I talked a lot about when we were first developing it, and we wanted to see if we could create a platform that actually people could choose whether they wanted to experience it at night or whether they wanted to experience it in multicolored version you know and I, that is certainly something that we might explore in the future um the disco version disco <laughs> version but yeah, you the, know with the disco version <laughs> would actually be amazing for autism patients so when we right. were speaking with a doctor they were like then you can track where people are moving so if they want to spend more time in the green room or in the blue room, and then that gives very vital data back to the doctor about how their patient is feeling because they're not articulating it, but it's through their emotion. Mm -hmm. So it's not only, it's, it's, it's disco, but it's, I don't know, doctor disco, meaningful doctor disco. <laughs> <laughs> We found that with, um, we did an exhibition by James Terrell and we had three light yeah. installations. Mm -hmm. and the Gansfeld, which was this blue immersive environment, it was like being underwater, but you could breathe. Um, and we found that um, teachers with groups of uh, SEN teachers, special education, and these teachers were bringing groups back and back and back and it's because the kids felt really calm in there and they just wanted to stay in there and dwell in there. So we'd not even thought about that as a possibility. Terrell's a good example of that. I was going to say, our, my only um, similar uh, an, an analogy is that we have uh, in our radiotherapy rooms, you know, where people get radiotherapy treatment and we've uh, commissioned artwork in the ceilings. So people, as you know, come back for multiple ther radiotherapy and they're like lead line bunkers and you'll have to lie on a slab and, you know, have the... Uh, the therapy come down. So we did these backlit pieces. So there's one by Darren Allman, there's one by Sophie Rickett, there's one by Simon Patterson, there's one by uh, Susan Durges. So p patients come in and they'll say, oh, I want the Pat Simon Patterson room this time, or can I, is the Darren Allman work free? So that's, you know, that's how they are, choose making their pink or their blue or. I love that. <laughs> that's really, oh, I, yeah. Or sometimes they don't know the name of the artist. They just go the constellation or the, the tree or whatever. Perfect. It's amazing. But I think it's amazing that in those really dark times, there's still joy. You know, you, you're kind of augmenting that whole experience. Yeah. I mean, for a lot of people, they're getting, they're getting treated. Yes. You know, so it's the journey out of, I mean, yes. you know, I suppose the journey out of cancer. Often then you, there's chemotherapy, which is a whole other thing. But sometimes it's... Uh, Yes, Camille. Oh, sorry. I, 
I can't hear you. You're unmuted, but to put your You're unmuted. You'd have but you have to speak. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you can type it. <laughs> Make a <laughs> oh, someone's joining now, <laughs> but you know what? Better late than never. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. Kat, so do you see the question? Yeah. The question is um, how often staff are educated on the artworks and if there are tours frequently? <laughs> uh, so we very important to me coming from a museological background is that each artwork is accompanied by a well-written <laughs> label that is accessible, but I think intelligent and slightly scholarly, but very uh, readable. So for me, it's really important that we present the works like we would in a museum, because it's a museum quality collection. Um, so there is that information that's available. We often uh, signpost our website that has a lot more information about it. Um, so there is, we do look for building capacity through the staff and um, we do see our role there as a way of empowering staff to get more interested and more excited. You might not have been there before when I talked about how we just got a great quote from a staff person saying, I didn't know I liked art until I started working at this hospital. Um, in terms of tours, yes, we, I used to do a lot of them, but as we're just a team of two for five hospitals, I, I've kind of, cut back a little bit on them um, because it takes a lot of time. But what I'm trying to do now, I've been trying to do for a while, and I'm really excited about it, is to give a tour to the security guards and to give a tour to the cleaners. Um, so separate tours for those kinds of staff. I have, you know, like there'll be some high-flying doctor says, oh, I love this, can I have a tour? And he'll get his team and I'll do it. Um, and the other tour I'm really looking forward to is the HEMS team. The uh, uh, what was this stand for? The helicopter emergency. So they said, um, if you show me yours, I'll show you mine. <laughs> so yeah. <I'm> like, <laughs> but they're so busy. I keep, you know, emailing them and saying about Hello. Because <laughs> yeah, I really want to go look at the helicopter. But um, there are certainly a lot of ways that we can engage staff. And it's, it's, it's in big part of what we do. Um, I'll divert a little bit because it could be slightly interesting. Uh, until now, the focus has been for patients because, again, I'm a team of two and a half people for five hospitals, um, and that has been was considered the priority. But now, as you can imagine, the past few months, everyone has talked about the health, well-being of frontline staff. So we just launched a big project called Hashtag 100 NHS Rooms, and by which um, dozens of artists have donated work that we've solicited and made new work that are specifically intended to be installed in newly upgraded staff restrooms. So there, I'm going to have really big labels with lots of information and, hope, and websites. So hopefully, from the cleaner to the porter, you know, the porter is the person who pushes people in, a, in the, chair, the chairs, um, they will have access to that artwork, look it up, and get excited about the artwork so we have victor bergen just emailed me he's doing a brand new work i don't know if you know victor bergen he's an artist sort of the founder of conceptual art um, um conrad shawcross mark wallinger made a bunch of work i mean you know a lot of in really interesting artists and it's been through shazad dawood who himself is an artist in east london so he's sort of been working through his network and so a nice interesting curator called nick hacksworth so they've been really leading the drive, driving this project. So that's a little bit of a side, but it is just a way to say that we are interested in staff becoming hooked on art and getting engaged and interested. Is that sort of what you meant? 
you can just nod or go. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, if there are no further questions, uh, you know, our, we operate with a very open door, um, policy. So if there's anything that you'd like to ask afterwards, um, you know where to find us, um, and we'll put forward any questions. Um, but really thank you so much. Um, you know, Gabriel, Katsu, Helen, Claire, um, for sharing with us your respective journeys this evening. Um, it's really beautiful and you know for everyone who for, for tuning in and joining in this evening um, a, 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 sm a small but select audience a small but select audience <laughs> we were engaged um, so um, thank you so much everyone and uh, you know more Sue good to see you all thank you, you. thanks guys Bye. bonsoir